Matt Lenehan Boxing Social in association with Freebets.com, Empire Fight Store, Forge Irish Stout. We're here with Eddie Hearn. Eddie, repping the Everlast. Yeah. Enjoying it, are you? You think it's going to fly, don't you? It's apparently, the, they've had to restock this particular hoodie because it, they're already flying off the shelf. Can I just say that the price tag in this, I'm not sure if it's the same price tag in your specific store, 20 pounds. The material, you know people wear that essential stuff? Yeah. Another level, this stuff. Get yourself down. Not just saying it, because obviously Everlast are a big partner, but this is, I mean, look, look, at, look at what it does to me. I mean, unbelievable. Wow, right, let's come on to boxing, <laughs> weighing. Um, Troy Williamson, let's start there. Miss where I couldn't hear how much he missed it by, £4. four pounds. Yeah. A lot now. What yeah. happens? Does that put that fight in jeopardy yeah, or is the discussion? It does put the fight in jeopardy. I mean, you know, you have a decision to make when you're Ishmael Davis. Number one, is it a move by Troy Williamson? No, not really. So you know that he struggled at the weight for a reason, okay? But is it going to give him an advantage in the ring tomorrow? How did Ishmael Davis make weight? Did he struggle to make weight? Is he going to recover fully in time? Obviously, the opportunity for Ishmael Davis is one that might not present itself again on a show like this. So you don't want to lose it, but it's like a, probably a conversation between Sonny, the trainer. What I would be doing is I would be saying, firstly, tomorrow, I want to reweigh. And you mustn't be, I know I'm going to rehydrate to this number. You mustn't be over that, because that's when they get into the ring and there's a discrepancy. Do you know what I mean? Plus, financially, you want to make sure you push for a deal. That's the job of a manager. So personally feel like it would be a mistake for Ishmael not to take the fight but who knows you know you don't know what goes on in camp um, and hopefully they'll fight but there is a chance it might not happen I was going to say is this normally the case where the other side goes look we messed up and then there's money exchanged there is but it's more than money because you don't want to lose the fight yeah but you don't want to lose the fight so you don't want to give away weight and then lose the fight that you could have won if it was at weight or you could have walked away from but also when you're Ishmael Davis opportunities don't come like this all the time yeah. so you don't what are you going to do not fight and then not fight for another 12 weeks but what i would be doing is making sure that the weight tomorrow is recorded mm -hmm. privately so that you know that yeah. the fight's fair and, and hopefully that's what they agree I've seen a lot of talk around um, dalton smith this week he's been very much when adam azim's name gets mm. brought up look that's yeah, back of my mind but yeah. and I, I know you have to because the opportunity here yeah. is far greater than that'll catapult yeah. him to world level but i heard comments saying that even if you know whatever happens that won't be the fight that happens next no, well, that's what we've been told by a boxer oh, so, so they've confirmed yeah, whatever they happens now we're not doing the fight next but if dalton smith gets knocked out or gets beat they might fancy it <laughs> do you know what i mean if dalton wins against a peter absolutely no way they would go anywhere near dalton smith so we, we expect them to pull out. We've been told they're not doing the fight, but I do expect if Dalton was to get beat, they might all of a sudden fancy the fight. Is that a better play by them than in the long run to say, look, we'll have a look and see what happens rather than that? Yeah, maybe, but if you're talking about Keyshawn and you're talking about this fight and that fight and you're not ready for Dalton Smith, you're kind of bluffing the public. Adam Azim is not ready for Dalton Smith. He's a really good fighter that in time, I think could go on and maybe win a world title or whatever. But... When the fight gets called and you've been talking about him and you've been talking about Keyshawn and this and you're not prepared to fight the British champion, I don't think it's a, a, a silly move, but you're just better off being honest. See, I would have pulled out ages ago because now it's got really embarrassing and it's become quite awkward. So next week, I think they've got a show. Everyone's going to be saying, I mean, firstly, this Times article, that I mean, you're going to get bombarded, but you're also going to get are you fighting Dalton Smith, especially if Dalton wins? And you've got to come out with some blurb in front of you lot to kind of not embarrass Adam Azim. And, and unfortunately, and although Fraser Clark and uh, Fabio Wardley did fight a year on or whatever it was, it's embarrassing for the fighter. If you ask Fraser Clark how embarrassing that moment was for him and how it affected him and his career, he will tell you it was handled appallingly. And this is a, just a carbon copy of that, rather than just coming out. See, I would come out and I would say, well, I've spoken to the team. We think Adam Azim is going to be levels above Dawn Smith, but we've got our own plan. We think we may be one or two fights behind him in terms of experience. So we're not going to be fighting Dawn Smith now, but we're going to work away. And in the future, that could be a massive fight. You have to take the pelters that will come, because they're going to come, but you front it up. See, and that's my job. 
Is that experience? Is that down to maybe yeah, a bit of experience? Of course, but you know, some members of Adam's team got plenty of experience, Barry McGuigan and all these people, but they're not really in front of the camera making the moves. Sometimes you have to have your fighters back. You can't allow Adam Azim, who is probably quite vulnerable in front of the media because he's just does, you know, he's only a, a young man, to come out and answer questions. Because what he's going to say is, I don't really know. I, I'm just the fighter. I'm I, because he'll fight Dawn Smith, just like Fraser would have boxed Fabio then. Yeah, he'll go. I'm real, I'm up for Dawn Smith, but I don't know what's happening. And then you start thinking your team is questioning you. Your team don't believe in you. What what direction am I taking? But you have to come out and front it up for your fighter. So what I would be doing is I would say, no, no. Adam Azim would fight him tomorrow. I'm not letting him fight him. Shane McGuigan's not letting him fight him because we, we have our own plan. Dalton Smith's a very good fighter. To be honest with you, if Dalton Smith beats Jose Zapida, they've kind of got a great excuse because they just go, Dalton Smith's world level and we're not there yet. We will be, but best of luck to him. We'll see him in a couple of fights when we are. So we'll see. You touched on there. Um the times out of clubs who are a boxer. I know there's obviously legal implications going into. So I don't know how much, but have you read it and much? What do you make of that? It's really, I mean, you read the headlines and the first paragraph is all you need to know. Some people run their business very differently to others. It's not a good look for boxing because some people's perception, which is not an accurate one generally, is negative about the boxing business anyway. When you're talking about cash payments to secret accounts, and I mean, for for I mean, boxers, you know, they don't have the same brand uh, recognition or, or power of Sky, but when Sky's name is mentioned in that, it's, I know how that will go down there. So I haven't read it in full, I understand what's happened. You choose your partners and you choose your, um, you know, the people you deal with wisely. And that's it really, you know, it's their business. We've got enough problems to worry about and good luck to them. Um, Dillian White made his return last week um, and a, in an interview with Lewis Hart um, for us um, he was asked about was he disappointed maybe that other people in boxing didn't come out for him and really vocalise the support and your name was brought up and he responded and he says look in terms of the game we're in he goes I've got 14 dogs he, says, in terms, he mentioned loyalty and said we've you know 14 dogs for loyalty I'd, I'd go to them kind of thing but are you, are you sort of are you disappointed with them with them comments or is that a case of really you expect it I'll get on with Dillian I mean Dillian didn't really show me any loyalty when he fought Tyson Fury. You know, we never had a contract. He didn't have to, but he chose really to not have us there by his side. And I feel like that was a, a, a mistake by them because I don't think they really knew what they were doing in a fight of that magnitude. In fact, when he walked out that night, I looked at him as if to think, you know, I think we could have been an asset around him that night, but they didn't want to pay us the money is that a Dillian decision yeah, then? I mean, ultimately, Dillian's the fighter, but he's got people around him and we, we get on. Do you know what I mean? There's no beef, yeah. but he didn't want to pay us the commission, even though we'd invested in all these fights for him. So, yeah. you know, loyalty works both ways. Yeah. And he wasn't under contract to us. And in fact, when we made the Anthony Joshua fight, he was speaking to everybody. He just got offered the best offer by yeah. us. So he just chose to go with us. I like people who go, do you know what? Matram and Eddie Hearn have done me right. They're the best in the game. I trust them. And they always pay me the most they can. And they always pay me on time. And they don't lie to me. I ain't going nowhere else. When I hear, I'm talking to them. I'm talking to them. It doesn't mean we're not going to do business again. But my heart is not in it anymore. Do you know what I mean? When you have my back and you believe in us, I will never let you down, ever. And the proof is in the pudding over the time. I've got people who are friends for life who basically believed so much in us and showed us unbelievable loyalty and we did an amazing job for them. And probably the two that stand out more than anyone is Tony Bellew and Anthony Joshua and Katie Taylor, you know, who's always, you know, these are fighters that don't look elsewhere. And you never take that for granted. Just because a fighter doesn't look elsewhere doesn't mean you have a special hold over them. You would just never let them down. And Tony Bellew, I would always get the last drop of money I would for Tony. Because you know what? When I showed him a contract for the David Hay fight, you know what he said to me? Whatever you think, just do the best for me. 
And I'm like, fuck. Do you know the responsibility? Anthony Joshua, who's re-signed with us three times, has never even contemplated leaving Metro. A fighter in his position, who he had people bombarding him with offers from Russia and America and all these people. You know, once there was a story came out when AJ's contract was about one fight away from being renewed. And it said, Dana White in talks with AJ. And I was like, oh my God. I mean, this was, I don't know, five, six years ago. Oh, what? What's this, right? And I went up to AJ and I went, mate, not being funny. Are you in talks with Dana White? And he went... Are you going a bit? He went, yeah, he called me the other day. And I went, what? He went, yeah, he called me. We were on the phone for like half an hour or whatever. Really interesting. And I was like, what? What do you mean it's really interesting? And he's like, no, no, just like really interesting to learn about the industry. And we was having a good chat because he loves to absorb information because he's a very bright guy. I'm like, he goes, obviously, I'm not going anywhere. I was like, anyway, when I become quite pally with Dana White, he told me that the first thing that AJ said to him was, just to let you know, I'm with Eddie and I'm not leaving Eddie. But, you know, and it's like, when you hear stories like that, yeah. and the fact that I know he hasn't been to these meetings like some fighters do, and I don't blame them, right? You've got to look after yourself. But it, loyalty works two ways. Mm -hmm. And if you have our back, I promise you, we'll never let you down. And, and that's very, very rare in boxing, particularly these days, because now there's so much money over there. And, and also, you know, I remember the situation with Devin Haney when he fought George Cambosis, yeah, right? Frank, yeah. So we built Devin with Bill from a stage, like, amazingly, to the position where he got a shot, at the he became WBC world champion, and then he had a shot lined up. And we had a dream together, me and Devin, we always talked about it, that he would be my first undisputed world champion, right, at the, at the time, yeah. that's what it was. And... He got to that point, and Lou DiBella froze me out, right? He didn't want me involved. So he did everything he could to take it to Bob Arum, and then basically they kind of colluded together to sign Devin, right? Lou might deny it, but it's, it's, it's true, right? And it's fine. Yeah. And Devin did everything he could to try and find a way to do it with Matrim. But I couldn't deliver it for him. Do you know what I mean? So at that point, right there, that is a point where I can't say you're disloyal. You've got an undisputed world championship fight. You've got an opportunity to, to become world undisputed champion, make, I don't know, three or four million dollars, and just, I, you can't show me loyalty that would stop you from taking that opportunity. And I wouldn't either. And that's why I said to him, I understand, you have to take it. And he said, I'll do two fights with top rank and I'll be back. And I said, mm, will you though? And the answer was, yes, yeah. he was. So sometimes loyalty mustn't stop you from making life-changing money and taking a life-changing opportunity. But the loyalty that you show will mean that you'll work that out. Yeah. I would say to Devin, as I did, you have to take it. Like if you'd have turned around to me and said, I'm not taking this because I'm not leaving Matrim, I would have said, mate, you have to take this. You have to. But when there's a situation of people just taking advice off the wrong people and then speaking to other people behind your back, that's fine. I've got loads of fighters that have spoke to other people and chose to stay with Matrim. Doesn't mean I don't do a great job from them. Doesn't mean I'm not rooting for them but it's just something a little bit more than that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's that lifelong relationship. Yeah. Darren Barker would never have left. Anthony Crawler didn't have, a, didn't have a, um, a contract. And even with the people around him that probably would have liked to have fucked off, I don't think he would have. And he didn't. Yeah. Right? So it's just the time when you look someone in the eye, 10 years on when it's all said and done, and go, you're a good bloke, you have my back, and I'm here for you, still. Yeah. But also, life's about taking opportunities. So it's a, it's a tough one. But there was a very long conversation about low team boxing. The, the question was Dillian White, who, you know, he, he can say that he's been loyal to us. He was loyal to us when the money was unbelievable and there was nowhere else to go. And then when there was, he explored other opportunities. No problem. But worked both ways. And he wasn't under contract with us. He'd done another fight with somebody else. He was looking around at other options. So when he... And he didn't need support, 
because he never asked me for support and I was never involved in the process. Mm -hmm. But I've got nothing to say on the matter because I'm not on the team. Yeah. When I'm on your team, I'm fucking riding the fucking waves and I'm smashing everyone out of the way and making sure you're safe behind me. Like Conor Ben. Well, look, last one from me yesterday, um, grassroots boxing, went to Aspire. Mm. Um, really good boxing gym down there. They're doing a lot of good work. And I know you, yourself, Alex, and Matram in the community have done a lot of work in trying to push this, especially with the government. Can you just talk a little bit about that? I think it's quite important. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, like the, the trips down to local amateur boxing clubs are probably now some of, if not the most enjoyable part of what I do in the sport because... I just feel like when you hear the stories and you look at opportunities for kids, kids have such a lack of direction now. And I'm such a massive believer that sport, I think sport is a better educator than even what you learn in the classroom. Right? That, that's controversial to you know, the teaching system. And of course you need education. Of course you do. Any employee is not going to just, you know, you can't just walk in an interview and go, I have no qualifications, but I played a lot of sport. But for me, if you play a lot of sport, and certainly if you played at a high level and, and you're involved in sport throughout your life, as an employee, for me personally, that makes me understand that you have the qualities that I want out of you in the workplace and that I want out of you as a person. Mm -hmm. Because I think what you learn in sport is just sets you up unbelievably for life. My whole childhood was brought up around sport. I think my best qualities have come through sport not sitting in a classroom, yeah. right? And when I go to these boxing clubs, I see kids that have absolutely no opportunity. And it's so difficult for me to sit there and give talks and lectures to kids from inner city areas who might be in a gang or might be, you know, moving towards knife crime and tell them about, no, what you want to do is, because they'll look at me and go, how, how can you relate to my story? You know, your dad had money, you've got money, you don't understand. I don't have opportunity. I have no one showing me the path. I, and, but sport, there's no barriers in sport. So when you're in that boxing gym, it doesn't matter who your dad is. It doesn't matter what flat you live in or what house you live in. You're all as one. You're a family. You're a community. And, and for people that need that in their life, like it's just massive. There were kids in there last night. There was a seven-year-old girl in there. I don't know if you saw her, Ellie, right? And she's skipping. They wouldn't let her in because she's too young and she wouldn't stop asking and asking anyway now she goes down there twice a week it's not just what it can do in terms of character and respect and manners and discipline and all the things that sport gives you but physically right they're saying that you know that young girl's lost a lot of weight she's become a lot more athletic do you know what that does that changes your confidence that changes the spring in your step that gives you mental clarity to make the right decisions that gives you resilience to deal with situations so Physical health is so important. And one thing that I was found last night down at Aspire, and I'll tell you the, just quickly the story of Aspire after, is boxing now is becoming a lot more of a fitness facility, which is really good, right? Because there's a lot of parents, like my daughter is 11. She goes twice a week to an amateur boxing club. She's never sparred. She's never had a fight. I don't think she will. But she trains for an hour down there, hitting pads, hitting the heavy bag, doing the circuits, and she absolutely loves it, right? It's completely changed her life. She is, like, all action. She plays every other sport. Her, she's improved in the classroom. Her attitude has improved, right? Her health has obviously improved as well. But she'll never box. So the old school mentality of going to, to an ABC was... We want to bring fighters through and you know he's gonna we're gonna get him carded and there's a club show on saturday that's great that's got to exist but we need to actually push boxing harder as a activity for physical and mental health and it being tough and making you resilient and all this kind of stuff because that'll help grow the numbers because a lot of parents don't want their kids sparring or boxing and i get that i actually disagree but they've got to want to do it as well but i think now what you're seeing is like last night there was a lot of kids in there that aren't boxing on club shows mm -hmm. that aren't sparring but they're in there like they're off the streets they're not talking to someone trying to convince them to run a package down there for a hundred pound and this is what you need to do we'll look after you come in with us next thing you're carrying a knife next thing you're getting stabbed next thing you're in prison next thing you're dead this is the slippery slope of, of making the wrong decisions and 
Aspire is a facility in Sheffield that ironically exists in a building that is for an educational building that is there for people who have been basically kicked out of school. You go to Aspire. And there are so many people being kicked out of school that they don't have the space for the boxing club anymore, which is quite ironic because if those people that were being kicked out of school went to the boxing club in the first place, they wouldn't be getting kicked out of school, honestly. Okay. So it's like, and the, the, the council and all the buildings now saying, you've got to go. It's like, what do you mean we've got to go? We're open every night. We've got 40 kids down here who, if they weren't there, and when you're speaking to the kids, you heard some of them last night, right? I've had a terrible time in my life. Boxing saved me. If I wasn't here, I'd be in a gang. You know, I'd be carrying a knife. I'd be doing this. And it just disgusts me that the government are so blind. And like, I don't, you know, moronic is a strong word, but it's like, how can you not go down there? Right? We have a terrible problem at the moment that young kids are moving towards crime and gang crime. They're carrying knives. People are carrying knives on the street and taking people's lives in of front nothing. of our eyes. Right? What is happening to this country? And I, like, I am 110% sure boxing can change that and sport. Right? So how can we not make the investment to do that? We're just sitting back. And if we don't change now, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And I can see the future, and the only way we can change that is by them changing the future. And that is trying to go to these areas, getting kids fit, getting them healthy. Everyone that's fit, everyone that's training, they're going to change their life. They're going to start making the right decisions. They're going to be motivated. These kids, have, honestly, they have nothing. Like, they have no opportunities. They come from broken homes. You heard some of the stories there last night. You know, this, this has happened in this kid's home. And they walk through that gym. It's like a family. People like Ronnie right who runs the club these people should be knighted right all these coaches should be getting mbes they're the real heroes of this country imagine giving your time every night for free of charge to to make sure that kids in the community have a home to go to to try and change their life do you think that in 10 20 years people are going to put forward themselves to volunteer to go because the mentality's changed it's like these people who lost their lives in the war you know, years and years ago. You think now if the government turned around and said, right, we need to go to battle for this country, who's in? I mean, everyone would do a runner. Probably me, me included. I'm not afraid to say it. But back then, the bravery of these people is incredible. And that, that's old school people. And that actually translates to the new, the, you know, that, that old school mentality of these coaches that are 50, 60, 70, 80, who are there every night. There's such, there's such a selfless move. To, to do, you know, most people now go, oh, what? I ain't going down, what? Going down the gym, oh, what? Got to open up. Whereas these boats, it's not even a question. It's not even, oh, I don't fancy it. It's my responsibility to my community. And those people are, are true heroes, those coaches, unbelievable. So it's enough of my run. It's been on for about 10 minutes. What I'm trying to say is support your local club. If you're a parent, take your kids to the local boxing club or get them into sport try and get them off their phones. I'm a parent as well, by the way, so I speak on, on the behalf. I've got a 14 year old girl, I can't get her off the phone. She's such a brilliant sportswoman, but isn't really, it's, like, it's, a, it's a mission. My 11 year old would never miss a training session across any sport, and I see what it's done for her attitude. Mm -hmm. And that will be the same for every single child. Every child is different, but it doesn't matter. They, it will change, it will completely change their route in life. Well said, I appreciate your time, Eddie, thank you.